Singapore, a modern metropolis. The city-state has come a long way since independence. It is now a leading financial hub. Singapore's growth established a foundation for SGX. After three decades of innovation, SGX stands peerless and a key player in the shaping of Singapore's financial landscape. This is the story of SGX's futures trading history. SGX story mirrors Singapore rise as a global financial center. We were founded by a team of visionaries who were bold and novel in their strategies and ideas. They had a partnering and innovative style that was unique at the time. And that's something we always have built upon. There was a great deal of speculation in gold in Singapore and it was taking place through what we then referred to as bucket shops. These were illegal trading firms who were collecting margins from speculators. The chairman of the MAS at that time, Deputy Prime Minister, Dr. Go Keng Sui, and the managing director, Mr. Lim Kim Sun, they were fed up. So they say, we've got to put these guys out of business. The MAS felt that the way to address the problem was to revamp the gold exchange of Singapore and create a proper, well-regulated, trusted exchange for the trading of gold. Symex was a case of converting a problem into an opportunity. So when Symex came, we thought uh, it was a very good uh, opportunity and uh, idea. Our vision then was to be the futures connection in Asia to be the gateway for the Asian derivative products. Cymex was the forerunner in innovation. We are the first Asian exchange to offer international futures trading. We are Asia's first financial and commodity futures market. Singapore had in fact come to us. They had sent representatives and they said, in effect, we know you're looking for a partner to launch a futures exchange, take us. When we first mooted the idea to the Chicago officials, particularly Leo Melamed, and he held up his hand in horror and said, that's not possible, because I think if you think about it, you are taking the credit worthiness of each other. And Cymex was a relatively new organization much smaller than what the CME is. There is a niche here for us to start something that uh, no one has attempted in Asia. Cymex was a pioneer back in 84. It pioneered mutual offset together with the Chicago Merck, which led to 24-hour trading and all the platforms that we use. That had never, never, never been in existence before. Mutual offset was the ultimate design of bringing your contract to a other entity and having it the same contract. It was a, a bunch of very intelligent people who worked very hard and wanted to build an exchange. And it was fun working with them because, you know, we were not getting paid as consultants. The, the, the payoff was hopefully in the fact that the mutual offset system would work. Then we must be prepared to make the sacrifice in order to, to forge the relationship. It was this sense of unity, the desire to make something happen, that impressed the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. From the day it was launched and that mutual offset began, we never had any major out, never a major problem, and the open interest started to fall in London and rise at the IMF. So it worked like magic. Sweetian and I had the opportunity to go and visit Chicago. There was an announcement to inform everybody on the trading floor that we were visiting from Singapore. And they called for a 30-second halt to trading in our honour. I felt very proud at that moment, you know, not just myself. It's really for Cymex and for Singapore that this is how much the CME value 
the partnership uh, with us. We invited them to Singapore to come and look at the country, the environment, the people, the financial institutions and the regulatory regime. What impressed me was Lee Kuan Yew. I recognized in the conversation I had with him that this was a man you could rely on. This was revolutionary. This was innovation at its extreme. No one had done this. And I wasn't quite sure how to do it. It proved to be a very successful venture. More than 50% of the revenues that we bring on board come from customers outside of Singapore. It makes a very uh, important milestone and definitely makes a mark for Cymex to be on the international map. So 30 years have passed on and this MOS link is still used and commercially uh, viable. Before we even started the first day of trading, there was the challenge of finding a suitable trading floor. At that time, it was known as the World Trade Center. Now it's Vivo City. We converted that place into a trading floor with, I think, three or four trading pits. Cymex just started, and then they were looking for locals, meaning that individual trade on their own accounts. They were eager to attract members, both local from Singapore, local from the Southeast Asian region, and foreigners, particularly foreigners with some expertise in the markets. You could lease a seat or you can buy a seat. You could actually at the time buy on installment. There was considerable interest, you know, from the men in the street who felt that, oh my goodness, here is a rare opportunity for us to own a seat on an exchange. These were the new financial entrepreneurs at that time when the financial markets in the world was exploding in volume because of deregulation that was going on in the United States. World trade was expanding and markets were becoming more and more global. Financial futures trading was a totally new concept in Asia in the early 80s. These fraud traders and brokers, they came from different backgrounds. The fraud trading community is a closed community with a very good and strong kampong spirit. I was with Cymex right from day one. We were thrown into that pit. None of us traded this thing before other than the six-week training we have in Chicago. I learned really from the ground what it's like to be handling orders and talking to people from the States and from London and local customers. There were about three, four hundred fraud traders and brokers on the various trading pits shouting out their bids and offers for the various contracts. It's a great place for a young person. You thrive on speed, thrive on ability to be able to pick up an order and execute it as fast as you can. There's this saying, hang tak by ho sai kai, meaning that you move faster, you'll be good for you. Competition is always there. And one of the things about trading floor is everything moves very fast. And that's the type of place. You kind of know each trader pattern the way they sell. We know when the market is going up and coming down. It becomes a very second nature of us, in the sense that because you, you use it day in and day out. It's very interesting, like, you know, sometimes you communicate with people. You know, you just second nature, you will show your signal. Instead of saying, hey, hey, buy 100 for me, we just say, you know, this way. By showing this way, they, they will understand that I want to buy a hundred. Palms in, you sweep in, right? So you buy. Palms out, you push out, so you sell. When you traded on the floor, even though you're operating in the rules of the exchange, it was your bond, your word. We make eye contact, and if I've said I'm buying it from you, I will honor that. Everyone was in it together, even though we were all competing with each other. When the open out crisis system stopped, people start either trading from home or trading from trading arcades. You kind of separated the people. The days of the trading floor are numbered. There was so much debate within the firm. So I had to figure out, would man beat the machine or would machine beat the man? 
Electronic trading has its advantages in terms of, of efficiency, establishing a better audit trail for transactions. It's a totally whole new learning curve yeah, altogether. Learning curve. You know? As far as the traders are concerned, you lose that special human contact feeling there is on the floor. You lose the noise or even the lack of noise that tells you times are quiet and then the decibel level rises and you know something is happening. Well, when you go off floor, you don't get that kind of an atmosphere. The dropout rate is high because Put it bluntly, the older people or the people who, who don't adapt so much or can't turn around so fast have issues. What they used to feel, they don't feel it. If you don't know how to adjust, that will be the end of your career. You just need to learn to be flexible and adaptable. The exchange decided that um, to help individual traders to migrate to electronic trading, they would run the open outcry and the electronic system simultaneously. At the end of one year, when we completely migrated our flow from flow to screen, while other exchanges had an 80% dropout, 85% of our traders continued to trade. A new chapter has begun for those of us who transited into the electronic world. On Wall Street, the headlines said it all today, the morning after the worst day in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. The market started becoming more volatile. And Monday, the 19th, was Wall Street crash. The winds blew, and that house fell with a mighty crash. There was definitely some sense that there was something happening, but nobody, nobody expected a fall 20%. As the news of what happened on Wall Street hit the Asian markets, we were the first markets set to open. But regulators and market participants throughout Asia decided not to open their market. The concern was, should we keep the market open? Our leaders were very visionary. Keep it open because we are a risk management center. Nobody knew it was going to happen. Not only had the Dow fallen so much, but there was no cash market for which to price our futures. The index seesawed all the way. We were standing in the pit. Monday opening. We closed around 24, 25,000 the night before. A major brokerage house said 19,000 offer. Immediately we knew something very serious. We're talking about offers before the market of 15 or 20 percent below the previous close. The market plummeted. That was uh, probably one of the most uh, crazy day on the trading floor. One of my friends who rang me up and he said, Kok Song, do you know Havoc has broken loose on Cymax? The Nikkei contract, you know, has plunged. There's a lot of panic sellers. The orders were streaming in. We were working so hard, we all took off our jackets. During that time, there's no such thing as a circuit breaker. There was no way that any exchange could be prepared for that in terms of the amount of margin deposits you have had to collect to protect those who were at the losing end of those trades. We have guys, we, we know that uh, that day alone made 10 million. This is a nightmare, you know, for people who run exchanges. And I said, look, I'm the chairman of Cymex. I don't want, you know, the exchange to default. I don't want the exchange to get into, you know, massive financial trouble on my watch. Immediately when market closed, there was a meeting being called by the exchange. It didn't break the exchange despite of such a big swing. Cymex was criticized, but nobody knew of circuit breakers. Nobody understood the impact of portfolio insurance then. Who's to say what the right price for the only risk management facility that was open that morning after the Wall Street crash? I give Cymex enormous credit for opening. The city at the center of the financial storm was projecting a mood of forced calm. The markets even made modest gains today. But Singapore, a place where rectitude and discipline are the norm, has been rocked by the bearing affair. He was uh, trading the Nikkei contract and he was building uh, large positions. He was constantly in the market, moving the market around. Right throughout, we kept getting enough reassurances from senior management in Bearings that they were completely aware of the entire build-up of positions and they were completely in control. Just the day before Bearing collapsed, 
Rumours were all over the place saying that Bering had run out of margin and they did not have the money to support their position. Halfway through the day, suddenly Nick Leeson's favourite order feelers appeared and started buying. By the hundreds, you know, and he did that throughout the whole afternoon. And everybody is saying, where did, he, where did he get his money? It looked like Bering was still uh, kicking around a lot of money and everybody, no choice, but started to buy back their position. The next day, the Wall Street came down and the market started to come down again. And this time, there was no support and it crashed all the way through. I could see Nick Leeson standing there and I could see him very, very nervous. He was bankrupt and he almost bankrupted bearings. There's this trading card which is uh, about this size and he was tearing them into small pieces and chew them and he swallowed the trading card. Officially on Monday, we made a margin call on them and they did not meet the margin call and that's what formally triggered the entire uh, decline for them and we then stepped in. The way it had been handled subsequently actually turned Samex around a little bit more. Our margin system really, really worked. After the entire situation was completed, we were able to return back to the trustees of the Bank, Bank, something like $86 million. There was more than enough money that was placed with the exchange to manage the crisis. The world saw that we were able to withstand the crisis and that uh, no customer has suffered losses because uh, that we are not able to honour our obligations. All the members of Symex actually has this bond that if one of these firms go under, you, 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 you have this bond to, to kind of step up to, 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 to support the exchange and things like that. I think that helps the, the exchange in a big way. It was many, many years of laying the foundations. Symex continued to be a pioneer in Asia to introduce products. So Symex launched the first Japanese stock index future, the first Taiwan stock index futures. It all grew out of the respect and admiration that Symex garnered by the world and the world of finance. Financial capability, financial integrity, trustworthiness to command investor confidence. I'm glad that after 30 years, this market has become even more successful. For us, you know, being Singapore, we can only thrive as an Asian gateway. And that requires us to be constantly scarring for new ideas, new products, and compete in many instances against the home exchanges of those products. I think that's where SGX has positioned itself correctly as the exchange that offers access across in Asia. This part of the world is really where the growth is for the next two, three, four decades. Just as the Chicago Mercantile Exchange was the opportunity out in the West, I think the future is in the East. SGX is now the world's most international and connected exchange. Our multi-asset platform offers investors the ability to trade all of Asia in one place. We will innovate and deliver on our global investor demands. We have been doing this for more than 30 years and will continue to be a unique offshore hub in Asia.